be recorded. Well, um, today, as you can see from my screen, I have a PowerPoint presentation and it's called Christ, Our Complete Salvation. And uh, it, I, don't have, I don't have a long message, but I, I have one that's near and dear to my heart. And because this camp meeting is based in a revelation of the character of God, um, I, I can't go, I can't go beyond not sharing what I want to share. Um, I, I have to tell you that uh, I've been in the in the Godhead movement um, for a, a, about thirty years or so, and um, <clears throat> unmute yourself, Ken. Unmute yourself, Ken. Unmute yourself. I muted everybody. Got it. So um, it, it was a tremendous blessing to go from a Trinitarian Seventh-day Adventist to a non-Trinitarian Seventh-day Adventist to understand that Jesus was the Son of God. And for a number of years, I was just um, enraptured in that understanding. You know, I, I listened to Brother David give my introduction on the last meeting that I had, and it made me think of all the things and experiences that we've been through. It was, it was necessary that we understand <clears throat> that God had a son so that we could understand the love of God. It was necessary <clears throat> that that was in place so that when the time came for us to understand the two atoms, we were able to understand the two atoms and that <clears throat> we needed to um, have it clear in our mind, right? That without the impartation of the life of Jesus Christ, there was no hope for us. We needed to understand that to be able to understand what happened to Jesus on the cross, that only God is good. Our understanding of sin broadened to not only just being sin is the transgression of the law, but that <clears throat> sin is a state of separation from God. And the whole plan of salvation to save us from sin is to unite us once again with God. All these wonderful things we learned, and we continue to learn more about Christ and his righteousness, the blessings that we have received, the things that we're understanding about faith, the things that we're understanding about our eternal salvation, and, and all these things have taken 30 years. I suppose if I look at my own life, even more than that, because of, of where I was as raised as a Lutheran and how I, how, I, how I came to Christ and then how I became a Seventh-day Adventist and how I've continued to, to learn all these things. But, but I, have to, I have to say, it has taken 30 years for my mind to open up to things that are revealed in the Bible and have been there for 2,000 years. 2,000 years ago is when the Gospels were written, when Paul walked the earth, <clears throat> wrote all of his beautiful epistles that have helped us to understand what Jesus did. It's not that these things weren't always there. You, for those of you that know me, you know I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I, I love the spirit of prophecy, the writings of our pioneers. Look, <clears throat> I was a Seventh-day Adventist Trinitarian and reading the work of the pioneers. I read the works of Jones and Wagner, and I thought, man, I understand righteousness by faith. Then I became a non-Trinitarian, and I read it again, and I said, how could I possibly have understood what they wrote when I didn't understand God the way they understood it? The blindness. But I have to give God praise, honor, and glory because I'm going to tell you that it's the spirit that guides into all truth. It's not David Clayton or Ken Corklin or Natter or Imad or, or, any, or anyone else. It is the spirit that guides into all truth. And we all can be thankful for the, for the revelations that God has given us and, and our understanding. With that said, I want to touch a little bit on, on some of the, of the things that meant the most to me in, in this 30 years. And um, probably one of the biggest is, is our complete salvation in Christ and that God is not against us. I have, uh, I've been told that, um, 
going to have to move this because it's in the way of my how can I minimize this vid I need to be able to see my own presentation um, is your PowerPoint filling the screen I know you can you can move it to one side I can't because it's it's full. Um, right. I'm not sure that's a drawback. All right. Well, I, I'm I'm fine. So I was told as a Seventh Day Adventist that the character of of our Lord Jesus Christ is to be re reproduced in those who believe in Him as a personal Savior. And for many many years. <clears throat> As a result of statements like that from the spirit of prophecy, and that is a spirit of prophecy statement, I thought that I needed to fix myself. That, you know, in order, I knew that Jesus was coming soon. I knew that I lived in the end of time. And, and when I read statements like that, <clears throat> I thought to myself, well, the only way that the character of, of my Lord is going to be reproduced in me is if I change myself, right? To become more like him. And I tried. My focus began to be on works, and, and let me tell you, there's a place for works. In 1 Timothy 6.18, Paul is writing to Timothy about the church, and he says that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So even Paul the writer of everything that we love about Christ and his righteousness, <clears throat> and righteousness by faith, says that good works are important. <clears throat> the same writer that talked about us having the character that it's, is needed in the end of time to be like Christ also wrote that our acceptance with God is not upon the ground of our good works. But our reward will be according to our good works. Now, <clears throat> our salvation is not based in good works, but is our reward? Does good works play a part? Well, <clears throat> it most certainly does, because here's what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 27. He said, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. It says it again in Revelation 22, the Lord at the very end of the scripture says, and behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his works shall be. You can, you can look at some of these things and you can begin to think, well, I need to produce good works after all. <clears throat> I need to reflect the character of Christ. And it's, these are plain biblical statements, right? I mean, <clears throat> Um, when Christ comes, he's going to reward according to the good works. But if I go back to that original statement, right, those good works are acts of kindness, not necessarily keeping of the law, right? Distributing to those that have need and, and willing to communicate the gospel to others, is what Paul was talking about. But as a Seventh-day Adventist, I began to think that good works had everything to do with the law, keeping God's law. In Romans chapter 8, we're all familiar with this statement. With respect to the law, it's plain and simple. It says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk, not after, who walk after the spirit. And if you come down to verse 7, it says, because the carnal mind, is enmity against God, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now, <clears throat> the next line that you see on the screen is actually a quotation from the Spirit of Prophecy, where she quotes the exact same verse, but in parentheses she puts a carnal or natural mind. You know, to our words to our pioneers meant something. And that word natural, I I, I tell you, it was a turning point for me when I came to an understanding of of uh, the two atoms, and I, and I began to read what was written about our natural mind, because, you know, in the 1800s, 
is when when words meant something to a lot of people. People like uh, Webster wrote the first dictionary. And uh, I looked up that word natural and what it simply means, a natural mind is just the way you are born, right? It's the way you come into existence. It's, it has to do with the species. And, and there was so much controversy over <clears throat> whether or not we are born sinners or not born sinners when the scripture is very, very clear, right? We are born carnal. We're born in the first Adam. <clears throat> we can be a partaker of the second Adam. And being born in the first Adam, not subject to the law of God, we are at enmity against God. And <clears throat> we cannot keep his law. Jesus made it abundantly clear. He said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. That includes keeping the law. Paul wrote it this way. He says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. <clears throat> in Adam. Without conversion, there is no hope. <clears throat> the spirit of prophecy says the law requires us to present to God a whole. It demands of men today just what it demanded in Adam and in Eden. Perfect obedience, perfect harmony to its precepts in all relations of life under all circumstances and conditions. No unholy thought can be tolerated. No unlovely action can be justified. As the law requires that which no man of himself can render, the human family are found guilty before the great moral standard, and it is not in the providence of law to pardon the transgressor of the law. No hope. <clears throat> but she goes on and she says, but standing before that holy good and just law and finding our condemned because of transgression, we may cry out, what shall we do to be saved? That is the purpose of the law. The law is our schoolster to teach us our need to bring us to Christ. And this is what people do when they read the Bible. They are, they are self-condemned. They think, as I look at their lives, I'll never be all that I should be. Thank you. And they, they cry out in some despair, lack of confidence. What must I do to be saved? Now, the, lo the logic there, when you say, what must I do to be saved, right? And, and, and in order to, to have things reached the way they were, you think to yourself, well, all I need to do is to repent. Repentance, by the way, all that all repentance means is turn around and start going in the other direction. To, turn, to, to repent is to turn around and go in the other direction. Simply means stop doing the things that you were doing and start doing the things going towards God. I think many people don't get past this statement. What must I do to be saved? What's the, what's the key word in the statement? Do. What, what, what can I do to merit the love of God? What can I do to earn salvation? And, and and people they they I, I think and a lot of Christians get stuck right here. They never think that they're good enough. I, I can't tell you. Thirty years I've been in in the, in the message. Thirty years, and as I've been going through for thirty years, every camp meeting I go to, I find people and I talk to people and I share things with people, and they inevitably tell me they lack confidence with God. They're not sure that they're forgiven. They're not sure that they're Christian because. I think of a lot of it has to do is they think, what must I do to be saved? And they're never satisfied with what they do. It's a very powerful statement. What shall I do to be saved? In Romans 3.20, 
I would like to, uh, to read this statement. <clears throat> Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. <clears throat> but now righteousness, now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all them that believe. And there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. <clears throat> being justified. What's that word next? freely by his grace or his goodness through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for remissions of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. So we are saved by grace through faith. <clears throat> there is but one way of escape for the sinner, Ellen White writes. There is but one agency whereby we may be cleansed from sin. <clears throat> the sinner <clears throat> must accept the propitiation that has been made by the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, that word propitiation is a big word. A number of years ago, oh, I don't know how long ago it was. Uh, man, <clears throat> I remember I, it, was, it was a Friday evening, a Sabbath evening. And I was reading and I came across this word propitiation. I looked it up and I, I was reading a couple of other things and all of a sudden it dawned on me. It must have been about one o'clock in the morning on a Friday. And I came to a realization that God is not against me. God is not against me. And that word propitiation to the pagans means, the word propitiation means to appease the wrath of somebody, right? The pagans, when believe that when something goes wrong, they used to have to offer a sacrifice to their God to appease his wrath because they believed that the wrath of their God was upon them. And this has creeped into Christianity to the point where the <clears throat> Christian's concept of God is of such that they believe that the God of love will burn a sinner and sustain his life so that he can continue to burn him over and over and over forever and ever and ever. And if you think the remnants of those of that 1260 year concept in Christianity hasn't had an impact on us, it has. That's why people don't have confidence with God. I'm going to go on the next one. A complete offering was made for mankind. God so loved the world that his only begotten son. That's the cry of Christianity. John 3, 16. <clears throat> Ellen White wrote, not a son by creation, nor as were the angels, nor a son by adoption. As is the forgiven sinner, the son begotten in the express image of the father's person and in all the brightness of majesty and glory, one equal with God in authority, dignity, and divine perfection. The spirit of prophecy wrote that we as sinners must accept the propitiation that God has made in the Lamb of God. Notice. <clears throat> It doesn't say that God has to accept the propitiation. It says we have to accept the propitiation. The problem was never with God. The problem was never with God. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. Does that sound like God's wrath needed to be appeased? Or did it, does it sound as though God needed to do something for us so that we could be changed? The propitiation was not to appease the wrath of God doesn't mean that God didn't love us. God did love us. <clears throat> In Romans 5.10, it says, for if when we were yet, we were enemies, 
we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Notice it doesn't say God was reconciled to us. It says we were reconciled to God. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. <clears throat> the cross reconciled us to God and the life of Jesus Christ <clears throat> is how we are saved by being a partaker thereof. God is not against us provided his son to do something for us that we not do for ourselves. That was the love of God. When we were yet enemies, when we didn't ask, we couldn't ask without his helping. When we were his enemies, <clears throat> as soon as Adam and Eve said, God instituted the plan of salvation and said, I will send my son to bring them home. Everything that we understand about what Christ did when he was here, was to change our minds about God. That's why this, this meeting and meetings like this are so important for us to reflect on the character of God. And the character of God is that he has always loved us. That love has never changed. It's going to be painful for anyone who doesn't accept his love and accept his, the, the, the merits of what Christ did. It's painful for God to destroy the wicked because he loves them. The atone, I, I love this statement. The atonement of Christ was not made in order to induce God to love those who would of, uh, whom he otherwise hated. It was not made to produce love that was not in existence, but it was made as a manifestation of a love that was already in God's heart. An exponent of the divine favor in the sight of heavenly intelligence and in the sight of unfallen and in the sight of the in the sight of a fallen race for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life we are not to entertain the idea that God loves us because Christ died for us boy it's the norm in Christianity right there I'll say it again not to entertain the idea that God loves us because Christ died for us but that he loved us and that he gave his only begotten son to die for us because it was the only way he could save us. <clears throat> First John 1 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin the david was talking about us being perfected and i and i have to i have to read this this quotation very very clearly because i'm not an i'm not an evangelical christian that believes that everything was done at the i think that all sin was dealt with at the cross but i'm telling you without the resurrection of jesus christ and the ministration of christ as our high priest administering his spirit to us there would be no hope because without the ministration of the spirit you are not a christian but sin was dealt with at the cross we were perfected by what christ did at the cross because every sin was dealt with <clears throat> the union of divinity with humanity <clears throat> to the fallen race a value which we scarcely comprehend now the divinity that was put into the i'm sorry the divinity and humanity that was mixed in was the beginning it showed us that god was willing to dwell in sinful human flesh on top of the fact that he needed a man when separated from god to come back to god that's at, that in itself is is a wonderful understanding. If you if you haven't read the Broken Curse, please read the Broken Curse. But the union of of divinity with divinity was not for Christ alone. Let's let's read on. Christ reconciled the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. Oh, what compassion and love are here revealed! How is humanity exalted through the of Christ? His sacrifice was ample 
and complete. The Holy One died instead of the unholy. He clothed himself in filthy garments that we might be wear the spotless robe of his righteousness, which was woven in the, in the loom of heaven. The whole debt for all who would believe in him as their personal savior, his blood cleanses from all sin and purifies from all unrighteousness. All is a big word. In him, through alone, we have forgiveness of sins and through faith in his blood or his life, we have justification in the sight of God. Man, Jesus did for me what I could not do for myself. And my faith in what he has done for me, key to my salvation. And knowing that God loved me so much that he gave me his son tells me that I can trust him with my life completely. This is a big thing in our Christian experience. If, if, if Jesus is holding you in the palm of his hand, who can take you out? If you gave yourself to Christ at the beginning, the only one who can remove you from Christ is yourself. But why would you ever want to do that? Why would you trust the one who you committed life to? Not that you will continue to be a Christian, that he will bring you through. I'll say that again. Committed yourself to Christ. Do you trust that he will bring you through? Every time you look at yourself, you'll never be satisfied. To so look at what he has done for us, see the love of God in Jesus, and trust that he will do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. That's what he came here to do. That's what he's in heaven to do. That is what we need all the way to the end. It will avail nothing for us to do penitence, to afflict the body for the sin of the soul, or to flatter ourselves that by our good works we shall merit or purchase an inheritance among the saints. <clears throat> when the question was asked of Christ, what shall I do that I might work the works of God? He answered, this is the work of God that you believe in that he has sent. That's our work, is to believe on he, God, who sent him on to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Do you trust him? I appreciated Brother David's talk today about trusting God. You can't trust God without understanding his character. I'm, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, God is not against you. When he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and, and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's just a fact. Our Christian experience is, is really an ever approaching unto God. And when we sin, we feel like we can't go to God. But in reality, right, because of what Jesus had and is doing. Look, in the Old Testament, if, if you, you, you would approach God, right, you, 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 you came, right, and, and you, you had, this, you had a, a, an offering, a peace offering, a thank offering, a sin offering. I, I don't care what it was, but you had to stop at a curtain. Then the priest took your offering beyond the curtain into the, into the courtyard, and you just had to follow by faith. And then there's another curtain. The, there's another curtain between, between that and, and the holy place, right? And, on, and, only the, and the priest goes in there. And then there's another curtain. Between there and the holy and the most holy place. And and what happened when Jesus died? When Jesus the curtain was rent in two. And what does Paul say? He says, Thank be to God. We can come boldly to the throne of grace. Boldly. Not to the first curtain, not to the second curtain, not to the third curtain, but boldly to the throne of grace whenever we have a problem or a trial. Why is it that we don't have confidence with God? Why is it that we don't have confidence with God? We are not to do something to purchase our entrance to heaven, for the Lord gives us heaven through the merit of Jesus Christ and not through any merit of our own. Good works are not the result. Good works are the result of faith and love. 
Good works are the result of faith and love. When you, when you understand these things, you're, you, you're, I, I don't know how it was for, for everyone. For, for me, in my Christian experience, I, I went through a trial and I, I was crying out to God for days. And all of a sudden, an overwhelming peace came over me. I had lost my father. I had lost my grandfathers, the father, my grandfather that had raised me. I came to realize that God was my father, thanks to Jesus Christ. And an overwhelming peace came over me. And the, the joy of understanding, right, that God was not against me. I, I, I tell you, when I, when I came to that realization at one o'clock in the morning, I woke up my entire family. I was so, I was so excited. It is only through faith in Christ that sinners may have the righteousness of Christ imputed to them and that they may be made the righteousness of God in him. Our sins were laid on Christ, punished in Christ, put away in Christ in order that his righteousness might be imputed to us who walk the flesh, but after the spirit. So now, now we're talking about not only um, imparted or, or imputed righteousness, but imparted righteousness. Look. Everything that Jesus did on the cross will avail us nothing, will avail us nothing if we are not born again, if we are not born again. Jesus told Nicodemus, he, he said, verily, verily, I say unto you, <clears throat> that a man must be born of water and the spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That word born is obvious. <clears throat> the way we were brought into this world will never be good enough. That which is born of the spirit of spirit. We must be born again because it was a problem with our first birth. <clears throat> Jesus went on to, to talk to Nicodemus. <clears throat> and um, in verse 14, he said that, uh, oops, He said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Our focus on the cross, the revelation of God's character with respect to what was done at the cross, right? Should give us confidence to believe. That's the point. Whosoever believeth should not perish, but have everlasting life as a result of what God did for what we could not do for ourselves. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. <clears throat> for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, that the world through him might be saved. Now that doesn't sound like a God whose wrath needs to be appeased. God sent his son to save us. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. In our, in our natural state, we are alienated from God. But when we come to an understanding of what Christ has done and a trust and, and, and a, love, a love for God, <clears throat> belief is trust. Really, belief is trust. You never will really believe in somebody if you don't trust them. We, we can say things like God does not lie. And we, can, we can say all these things. But the fact of the matter is if you don't believe in someone you, or, or trust someone, you will never believe them. If, you're, if your concept of God causes you to doubt your standing, how could we doubt our standing with God? Honestly, how can we do it? When all that he has done to show us his love, he has withheld nothing. Nothing at all. <sighs> Look, I, I understand. You know, I, I think of I think of Moses, right? And, and, and his sin. I think of Elijah and all that he did. And then Jezebel says, I'm gonna kill him, and he runs like a little baby, right? After after calling fire down from heaven, right? And and and, and this one this one really gets me. John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist. His, he, he, knew, he knew the surroundings of his birth and the miracle. John the Baptist is the one who has received visions from He's told exactly what it's going to be like when the, when the Messiah shows up and how he is going to. He sees the spirit of God come down on Jesus. Right? He hears God say, this is my beloved son in who I am well pleased. 
He must increase and I must decrease. He says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He says, you are, I, I, you come to me to be baptized. I want to need to be baptized by you. I'm not worthy to even untie your shoes. He makes, he makes proclamations about Jesus that are some of the most you know, amazing proclamations about Jesus in the Bible in John. And then after a short period of time, he says, are you the one or shall we expect another? John the Baptist. I can understand our weakness. I can't excuse it. I can understand it. <clears throat> I guess I suppose that, you know, we need to take to, to take heed that 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 when we we stand in case we fall, I I I, I understand all that. I, I I get all that. But brothers and sisters, to to commit ourselves to the holding of God that He will fulfill and do what we, what we have asked Him to do. You gave your life to Him. We have to trust that He will do for us all the things that we cannot do for ourselves, and He will. And He proved it when He gave His Son two thousand years ago. And every day when you ask for a rich measure of your spirit and he gives it to you in, 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 in your heart. Ask. <clears throat> Luke 11. And for those of that want to look it up, Luke 11, <clears throat> verse 9. I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek. And ye shall find, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and everyone that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened unto you. If a son asks for bread of any of you that is a father, will he give a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him for a fish a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall our heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit? To them that ask him. Without the Holy Spirit, you're not a Christian. When you come to God and you have given yourself to God and you ask for a rich measure of his spirit, you have it. How do you know that you have it? Because everything that God did 2000 years ago proves his love. And if he was if he if he didn't withhold his son so that he might save us, why on earth would he withhold from you his Holy Spirit, which was the reason that he came here so that you might be saved? I said that when we get down on our knees and we ask for a rich measure of the spirit, we doubt that we have received. Faith is not a feeling. I understand. I understand with respect to your Christian experiences. There will be times where you will and there will be times that you will doubt and there will be time. But I'm telling you, the word sure. And how can you know? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him has eternal life. How do you know you have that eternal life? Because you have the indwelling spirit of Jesus Christ right here. Christ in you, the hope of glory. <clears throat> God doesn't just, just look at you and see Jesus. He gives you Jesus. Hebrews 4. <clears throat> Verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest, not be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are without sin. Let us therefore, for this reason, <clears throat> come boldly, as I said earlier, to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in every time of need. You've done something wrong. You're not sure about your standing. Come. Come on to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come boldly. There's no curtain. <clears throat> There's nothing holding you back. There's no sin separating you from God. It, 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 it frustrates me when somebody comes to me with an Old Testament scripture that tells me that my sins have separated me from God. In the carnal state, that's true. In the Christian state, it's not. <clears throat> I 
I want to uh, I want to reflect on everything that Jesus did. Disease fled from his touch. The blind saw that their demons were cast out. The dead were raised. The tempest tossed waters were stilled at his command. And even as he hung on the cross, nature gave signs that she sympathized with her author. Look, when Jesus was on the cross, the earth was heaving. The thunder was crashing. The clouds came and gave a darkness that during noontime made it as dark as night. The earth reeled and heaven beneath her feet, <clears throat> beneath the feet of men. The sun clothed itself in sackcloth when the mighty angel ascended from heaven, parting the darkness from his track. The Roman guard fell <clears throat> as dead men before the resplendent glory and Christ in his Godhead shone forth as he burst forth from the tomb and rose triumphant over death in the grave. <clears throat> All these things were done. From the healing of the leper, every sign, every miracle, everything that was done, according to John, was for this reason. John 20, verse 30. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not even written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ the son of God, and that believing he might have life through his name. Oh, I, I, I like what it says in 1 John 5, where he that believeth in the son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not has made God a liar because he believes not the witness, <clears throat> not the record that God gave of his son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. <clears throat> it, we, we, we don't even begin to, I think, comprehend how fortunate we are to understand that Jesus is the son of almighty God. So this, this quotation is, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I, I hope, I hope you think about it. Shall our faith ever falter again, knowing all these wonderful things, knowing that God loves you when you were an enemy, how much more now that you are his son and daughter? Shall our faith ever falter again? What strong evidence or stronger evidence could God give that Jesus is the son of God? <clears throat> what greater evidence could be given of the power of a, and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ than that which has been given by those who were eyewitnesses of his majesty? Will those who claim to believe in Christ as a personal savior, that's us Christians, dishonor God by doubting that he whose guardianship they have committed their souls will keep that which has been committed to his trust against that day. Wow. Jesus is a risen savior. He came forth from the grave to vindicate his previous claim, firm the faith of his followers to establish the truth of his Godhead before men to make doubly sure the assurance that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, doubly sure. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> we've had to learn all these things to prepare us to give a message in the end of time. In 1888, a wonderful message came to the church and as a result of the rejection of that church, we have been here struggling. We have here this whole time having to relearn all the things that the church unlearned with respect to the truth about God, the character of God, what, what our mission here is on earth, to have faith in Jesus and the faith of Jesus. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God, which closes the work of the third angel's message. The last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of the character of God's love. That is the purpose of this camp meeting. I'm sure that my feeble attempt to reveal the character of God and his, and his love 
is nothing in the light of all that he himself has done. I don't need to reveal to you the love of God. He himself has done it in the giving of his son 2,000 years ago to take care of all of your needs with respect to sin and the giving of him daily in the daily ministration of the spirit so that he can keep you in the palm of his hands. That's what I wanted to share with you today. <clears throat> All these things tell us how close we are to that latter rain. I'm sure it's sprinkling on us as we speak, as we pray, as we have experienced, right? But I, I'm telling you, <clears throat> when our faith is sure, when our trust in God is all that it should be, <clears throat> we're going to be able to reveal the character of God in a way that has not been seen for 2,000 years. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your love in giving us Jesus. And Lord Jesus, we are so grateful Lord, forgive us for our weakness. But Lord, we give you honor and praise and thanksgiving for doing for us what we can do for ourselves. We commit ourselves to you today. We commit ourselves to you forever. And we trust that you will hold us in the palm of your hand. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.